chapter 1, 1 to 4, Habakkuk's first complaint, and then you get God's response, sort of opposite it. So you've got these two things going on. There's this dialogue, a dramatic dialogue going on in the book of Habakkuk. 1, 1 to 4, Habakkuk's first complaint. 1, 5 to 11, God's response. That's what we're on today. And then 1, 12 to 2, 1, Habakkuk doesn't like what he hears from God in his first response. So he, he complains again, he responds to that. And then chapter 2, 2 to 20, you get God's longer response. And then in chapter 3, what's happened is that Habakkuk has met with God twice. And the effect of that, no, no intellectual input that God has given him, no philosophical resolution of the issues, but simply having met with God, Habakkuk is transformed in that experience. And his complaint turns to worship in awe and wonder. So often we saw last time that what we need is not an intellectual or a philosophical accounting of the situation and the circumstances that we face, but a meeting with an assurance of the presence of God and his engagement in our situation and a reminder and a reassurance of what he's working towards. And as Hadley puts it, the righteous will live by faith. By trusting him with what we don't get. So Habakkuk's first complaint then was of the lawlessness of his times, the violence in his society, the effects of the absence of the fear of God, basically, in people. He's, he's, a, he's a bit of a traditionalist, but he did love a long time ago. And he's not wrong in his analysis of the society that he lives in and the things that ail that society. And his two big cries to God were very contemporary, very popular. The first thing he cried out to God was, why? And of course, none of us have ever done anything like that, I'm sure. Uh, and the second thing he cried out to God was, how long? And I guess we know that question too. How long? So where are we going to this week? God's response. Habakkuk has, has done the right thing. He's taken his hurt, he's taken his pain to God. Apparently he's done that for some time. And today we get to grips with God's response. But preparatory to unveiling a response to all this injustice, there's a sort of a, a warning that comes straight from God. Habakkuk, your prayer has been heard, your prayer has been answered, but look, here's the warning. Verse 5. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylon. God warns ominously the extent of the trouble of judgment that his people will now see. Habakkuk, you've been praying about this situation. Here's what has to be done about it. Now, now God is no alarmist. God is no sensationalist. God is a serious person. Right? This is all for real. The situation is actually serious. Habakkuk, you've done another half of it. That's often our situation, isn't it? We cry out against some injustice on our high horse, you know. We get a bit self-righteous about something. And it's, you know, God could easily turn to us and say, you don't want to half of it. You have no understanding. Four wake-up words from God come piling in through the prophet to alert these people. To alert the prophet and the people. Look, watch, be utterly amazed. Wonder. Now, very interestingly, that last one, wonder, is left out in the NIV. Uh, I can't see why. I can't see why, unless the translators were just getting embarrassed by the frequency of wow words in these few verses, you know? You, you sometimes, you do that, don't you? You can't have one more wow word in this sentence, you know? God is just piling up these wow words. Look, watch, be happy, amazed, wonder! And, and, and there's no preamble at all to any of this. There's no preamble to what God is saying. There's no gentle lead into this. Mm. Pow! No formula from the prophet like, the Lord answered unto me, you say. You know, none of that. Whack! Straight in. And the speaker just changes and the switch is made from singular to plural as God begins to directly address the people and their prophet. Now, now what's happening here is that the prophet and the people are being called upon during a time of violence and slaughter and suffering, which is all right up close and personal in their very own experience, God is asking those people in their coming, in their existing calamity and the worst that is coming, they're now being told about, 
God is asking them to consider what is going on, not just in their own street, not just in their own back garden, but on the world stage. The big plan, the world scene, the cosmic level. And that is the key to dealing with so much complexity in life. See the big picture here? See the big plan? See what I'm doing on the world scene? The prophet and the people must open up their perspective on events. We get focused, don't we? Do you know that I'm like that? We get focused on the nasty thing that's happening at the moment. And God is saying, ooh, there's a big picture here. Yeah. Bigger than you know. It's beyond you. You don't get this. Just consider this. Look at the nation, says God, because I am doing something. You're complaining, Habakkuk, because you think this and this and this, and people are getting away, and nothing's happening. And God is saying, oh, no, there's a big picture. You don't half understand it. I'm doing something. Here. Look at the nations. For I'm going to do something. Now, this is hard stuff. Let's just try and get our heads around this. If you were a secularist, right, an atheist or whatever, the, the forthcoming Assyrian invasion or Babylonian invasion is just going to be an example of outstanding human brutality. Mm. Those Babylonians are going to come and they're going to be wicked. Syria at the moment has nothing on this. And, and if you're a secularist looking at that, it would make no sense. It would be another piece of purposeless, meaningless, pointless human brutality. prophet is being called upon to understand that Israel's God is the sovereign Lord of his people and of the heathen and to grasp the extent and the intent of the sovereignty of God. God's bigger than this. And yet a terrible judgment is coming on the remnant of God's own people and God is the one who's bringing it because what they have done is so serious and by this means God can mend it. Now that is the difficult one. How can God mend it? I, says God, am the one who is doing this. What, really? This awful experience we're going to have? Yeah. And this is how the eternal plan and purpose of God is going to be fulfilled. Just in case you're thinking all those poor innocent people, um, there weren't any. That's Hanukkah's point. There hadn't been any. When is God doing this? Really very swiftly. Look at the nations and watch, be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you wouldn't believe even if you were told. In your days. The timing, you know, very swiftly. Uh, the way people work is that they live, we live, I suppose, expecting everything to go on pretty much the same. Regardless of how we behave, regardless of how the world around us behave, regardless of our society and what it's like, we expect things to carry on the way they are. We cry out for justice, but we don't want it. We expect things to go on pretty much the same, regardless of how people misbehave, regardless of the extent to which mankind rebels against God. That's the way man works, and the way that God works is that he takes complacency like that by surprise. You know, Jesus said, didn't he, I'm coming like a thief in the night. There's the warning. There's what you've got to do. Can be complacent with me? Don't be complacent with me. Thief in the night. <clears throat> when I was a lad growing up, I, I, was, I, I was blessed with um, a number of real old characters amongst my elderly relatives. And there was always no shortage of the old boy who was sitting in a chair in the corner in some house in the valley somewhere. And uh, he'd always have a story for the boy. The boy would tell me, yeah, and he'd always tell a story. And there was always something going on. I, I remember the sayings of the ancients. It's, it's great to have that sort of upbringing. Really. Uh, as a little lad to go around and be dragged around with all these people who've got such a lot to tell and such a stories of wonder, you know. Um, I remember some of the other people saying, oh, I'll never see it happen. It'll never be in my time. It won't happen in my day. And how can you say it will? Yeah, well. 
Not only would the timing cause surprise, but where it's coming from is going to be a source of huge surprise as well. Verse 6, the beginning, I'm raising up the Babylonians. It's coming from an unexpected source. It ain't coming from where you might expect it. I'm raising up the Babylonians. And when they see it, these people, they'll have terrible trouble believing it. Believing that God would ever do that with them. I'd like to think that God would never. My God wouldn't do something like that. And that's going to be exactly the situation with the Jews and, and, and the Babylonians. Something that you would not believe, even if you were <coughs> told. So next, God identifies the Habakkuk, the surprising instrument that he's raising up to bring about this judgment. The slide there, if you like a piece of rock with carvings on, I know you do, is, uh, is uh, it's in the British Museum. It's Asher Banapal riding and hunting. It's a lion hunt, I think. Uh, a relief from... Uh, the North Palace of Nineveh, about 640 BC, which is around the right time for us. That hung on the wall at this time. In the palace of the people who are coming to do this. The really astonishing thing, the immensely hard thing to accept, is that God's people are going to be overrun for their wickedness by a pagan people far more wicked than they. It's almost as if God was saying, you want it wicked, here's wicked. You, you have some of that. You want it, you have some of that. Old oh, Palmer Robertson, who's got a good commentary on Habakkuk. Uh, the prophet Habakkuk had prayed, hoping for some form of purging of the wicked element of the nation. But the divine response speaks of such an utter devastation that even greater puzzle will grip the mind of the pious prophet. That rise of the Babylonians to power, it's, it's remarkably quick. In 20 years, 20 years, this small Babylonian country, had gone from well the old capital of Assyria, which they conquered in 614 BC, Nineveh they conquered in 612, Haran in 610, they routed the armies of Pharaoh Nico, king of Egypt, in 605. Within 20 years, they became the rulers over Babylonia, Assyria, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, when 20 years previously they hardly were known to exist. But their energy then dissipated almost as rapidly. So that they were easily overcome by Cyrus, king of Persia, in 539 BC, just in time to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah about Israel's return in 70 years, Jeremiah 29 10. Push, bang, uh, uh, up like a rocket down like a stick, yeah? And they were gone. God raised them up. And then drop which is more than they deserved. No more than they deserved. Babylon is a great example of God's control of the nations of this world. It's so great, he orders their rise, he orders their fall, according to and as the means by which his plans and purposes are fulfilled. And we've got to remember that, because we can look out on the world scene, and because we've got these new hearts, we've got a new heart and a new spirit within us to use Jeremiah's words, we feel very tender to the, the way the politics is working out in the world. We will. We'll feel very tender about North Korea when we read about it. We'll feel very tender about Syria when we read about it. We'll feel very tender about Afghanistan and what's happening there at the moment. With the women in politics and all the rest of it. We'll feel tender about those things. We should. We should. The faith comes back to this premise. That God makes kings and brings them down. God deals justly. Although it doesn't look like that to us because our perspective is so poor on the situation with the nations of men. And he's working it to a point we'll come to that. Okay. There's the warning, verse 5. There's the unexpected instrument, verse 6, the beginning of verse 6, and there's here's what you've got coming. God, I can't deal with this in detail, you'd be very relieved to hear that. God deals with 20 explicit details for Habakkuk. Detailing the coming force of what's happening and the retribution for sin that Habakkuk has cried out about. I asked you last week to notice this, that God is never, ever doing nothing about something. He may be doing something we can aspire and look forward to and that's great, we notice that and we're happy with that. 
And he may be doing something, yeah, he should, but we hoped he never would. And the just should live by faith. Or he may be doing something we don't want to hear about because knowing about it too far in advance is frankly going to scare us to death. <coughs> but still, the just should live by faith. You know, he's never doing nothing. He's always doing something. And whatever he's doing, the just shall always live through it by faith. It may not be what we want. But it's by, it's by the sort of means that surprise human beings the most. The sort of thing we simply cannot grasp, understand or make sense of. The sort of thing we least expect from our God that he actually goes on to exceed our wildest dreams. Why is he bringing down the kingdom of Judah? He's bringing down the kingdom of Judah because of its rebellion and its sin against God in order to erect what? Not another reunited political monarchy. But to get back to the days when Israel did have no human king and was better off for it. We saw last time how the human kings they insisted on having and so on. And, and God had said what would happen if you do it. It's happened exactly in, in detail. It's all there. And then God is saying... We tried that, we insisted on it, I'll let you have it for a while, it's gone. There's a king coming who will reign in righteousness. He will rule in righteousness. And we know his name. This is all these terrifying circumstances that are about to be unleashed on the wayward, rebellious people of Judah and the kings. God is doing something in all of this that moves human history forward along its course, preparing the people, that's so important, and preparing the landscape for the coming of the authentic saviour king that they longed for but had misidentified where it was going to come from. And here is what it most surprisingly looks like. As I said, there's, 20 couple, you know, there's, there's this whole set of couplets here to describe these people that are coming, they're a bad lot. Okay? God is using an extremely bad lot to push forward the coming of the king. Mind blowing, isn't it? Firstly, a nation that is bitter and impetuous. We do see nations that become in the national character bitter and impetuous. I've been in situations where a nation has become bitter and impetuous, um, <laughs> sometimes standing quite close. Um, <laughs> we've been in situations like that. You see, where a, a, a national psychology, fed in certain ways, becomes quite bitter and quite impetuous and quite brutal. Again, Robertson, because of the spirit of bitterness over life, its inhabitants act with irrational cruelty and destructiveness. They're impetuous. Acting on impulse, without taking time to sort out the facts. So all the people they conquer suffer injustices. Impetuous people. I remember sending David as a 14-year-old with a knife in his hand into a crowd of people from a certain part of the world surrounding a car that had left the road and was in danger of sinking into a, into, into a salt flat. And I remember sending David that because we had a winch on our Land Rover and we were on the road and that's where we were staying. Uh, but all these guys had turned up from everywhere. I remember sending David with a knife in his hand to go and stab the, um, what's it called? Airbag. Airbag, that's the thing it's called. The airbag that was pinning this guy in his car and couldn't get out of there and then get him to steer this thing as I winched it out. And you send your 14-year-old son out amongst the people who are impetuous and they begin to shout and scream and bawl and they're all pushing and going different ways and you can't get any order in the chaos, you've just got to get on with it, you know? They're impetuous people. And these people act in ways that are not great. They take possession of dwellings that are not theirs. I remember hearing a story from a Norwegian lady um, who had sort of been married into our family uh, ages and ages ago. And uh, she, was in, she was in Bergen in the uh, Second World War when the Germans came in. And the German commander walked up a certain road with a beautiful view across and he said which house had the best view. And he said, I'm having that one. And just threw the family out. And he said, how unjust. That's these people. And more than that, verse 7, they are a feared and dreaded people, they are a law to themselves and promote their own honour. They are autonomous. They do what's right in their own eyes. What a paradox. The Almighty God, who's adamant that he will not share his glory with anybody else, takes this nation 
He raises it up, puts it back in its box. In spite of the fact that they're like this as a people. They will not look to God for any external criterion of righteousness. They will determine what is right and wrong for themselves, in inverted commas. And God says, I can do that with you. I can do that with you. Back in the box. Does that sound familiar? That attitude? At all? When nations decide, they're going to legislate what's right and wrong, they're the government. They so that they can rewrite God's laws for humanity and society. God says, okay, you can do that, but I can do that. They're quick. Verse 8. It's not that there's going to be a second chance, that the armies are not going to stop on the boundary, and God's going to say, are you sure you want to go behaving like this, you Israelites? No, no, no. No second chance, there's no phasing in period or anything of that sort. God's justice, once declared, is not only a big surprise to sinners, it's swift. They're violent, verse 9. Godlessness often accuses God and his people of scandalous violence. You want to see what godlessness is like. If godlessness asserts that Christianity and religion is violent, you should see what godlessness is like. Do it yourself. Habakkuk's already complained against his own people for their violence as they departed from God. And now he's about to witness them getting to feel what it's like to be subject to unrestrained violence. Unleashed. Irresistible. Force. Verse 10. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities by building earthen ramps. They capture them. See, politically this is how it worked for Israel for a long time. Um, Israel had allies. She was a small country, it's amazing she survived at all, really, politically. But what it was, there were kings all around Israel. They were the buffer states. And as Assyria and as Babylon rose and fell, they were these buffer states that, that, you know, they took the shock out of the advancing attack kind of thing. It's not going to work, verse 10. They mock kings, they scoff at these rulers around you, protecting you, you're working with alliances. They laugh at all fortified cities. The powerful kings leading those buffer estates are, estates are going to go down. And then you've got your fortifications, Israel. You've got your earthworks, like Ahab's fortifications to his chariot city at Megiddo, which you're going to have a look at, don't you? You don't like rocks and archaeology, do you? Um, but, but it's there. You're going to have a look at it. There's, you can see where the stables were, with horses and everything. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Fortified, you know, nothing. They capture them. They capture them. Leaving Israel's former strengths in the hand of the enemy to now become a thorn in Israel's side. And they're self deifying, verse 11. They sweep past like the wind and they go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. Oh, that is so familiar, isn't it? Our own strength has become our own God in this land. And it's nothing. These people that God has raised up to punish and correct Israel's idolatries. This people deifies itself, whose own strength is their God. Now if that sense of self-sufficiency doesn't characterise our age, our culture, our government, I don't know what does. There are lessons to learn. There are loads of lessons to learn for us. As we sit here at the moment thinking that things are pretty bad, wishing God would step in and sort things out, oof, don't mess about when he does. If we see so much of it, just so much, and, and you know, we think that's really bad, how much does he see? Or we can find ourselves easily fretting, binding about his apparent inactivity. We just don't see what's going on behind the scenes. God doesn't need our help. I know it sometimes seems strange to us. He certainly, as the fountain of all wisdom, is not going to need our advice about what to do either. God's ways are often obscure to us. I rather suspect that having had things cleared up for him and made plain in the way they are in this passage, Habakkuk might have been a bit happier with his former situation where he didn't understand what was going on, and it was quite obscure. Yeah, God's ways are often obscure because of us, to us. 
And because they're obscure, we, we, we tend to think perhaps that God is not doing anything. God is always doing something. Just don't know what it is. Heaven is busy. Earth is busy in sin and violence and self-destruction. Why do you think why do you think we haven't managed to blow ourselves up already? Why do you think we haven't managed to rip this planet to bits and, and make such a mess of things you can't do with this anymore? Well, it's because yeah, earth is busy in sin, but heaven is busier in sustaining what God has made. You know? He's holding back the man of wars and says there's long into it. The creator and the sustainer of the universe is mercifully busy, not just in holding back the forces of chaotic destruction, but also in steering the whole of history to its resolution, to its redemption, to its restoration in Christ. He's working on that. He is active. I mean, look inactive, but he's busy. And that, resolving, redeeming, restoring, that is what he's doing. How about you think you're telling me something new? I'm on it. I've been on it all the time, you've been praying and not understanding. Now weren't you happier when my ways were a little bit more obscure from you? And then of course, not only is in action, we have, we have problems with the obscurity of his answers to our prayers. Oh boy. Habakkuk hadn't been praying for the Babylonians to be raised up. Had he? It's the answer to his prayer. Perhaps Habakkuk had thought God might send another good king to reform, the way King Josiah had, or, or perhaps a king would lead Judah to recover fallen Israel and restore a revitalized united monarchy in the land. But God is not our servant. How hard to grasp is that? We are his servants. And he lives in the highest place. And he sits on the highest throne. And he sees everything clearly and with all wisdom rules accordingly. Faith is what's called for for us. Not advice. Faith. Faith is called for from us not least in the light of some of his most unexpected answers to prayer. And then there are the people he uses. <laughs> um, there are people he uses, and you think, what are they? I'm not happy with that. I mean, they're not, they're not one of us, are they? I remember years and years and years ago hearing somebody, I was a young minister speaking in a minister's thing somewhere, and you know, one of the old boys who must have been a bit deaf turned to one of the other guys and said, Is he one of us, is he? <laughs> is he one of us? I'm kind of a bit suspicious when God has got people who are doing and then God is working in ways that we don't grasp through people that we don't understand. Because you know what that is? God uses the most unusual people. If God can use the Babylonians to move forward his plans that lead to salvation, the coming of the king. Well, he can do what he likes. And he does use the most unusual people. There's hope in that as well, isn't there? If he can use the Babylonians, he can even use me, but hopefully in different ways. Now because God's ways are often obscure to us, something follows. God's ways are often misunderstood. We don't get it. But he's not inactive, so here's how it goes. He is active, we don't get it, we see things we don't understand. Does that make sense? Tell me if he doesn't throw cushions, this is really important. He is active, we're talking, right? We don't get it. God is misunderstood. The fact remains, despite our misunderstanding, that history is under God's control. And because of that, it always, surprising though it is, it always follows God, God's plan. And the people who have problems with that are the people who will not live by faith. The way the just will live by faith. It'll stumble many that we don't understand. If you've got a God you understand, you want a different God because he's not very good, is he? History is under God's control. 
and history follows God's plan. Here is the answer to Habakkuk's why question in the four, verses before this. It's not we looked at last week. Why? It's following God's plan. Here's the plan. It's coming together. And here's the answer to Habakkuk's how long. History also follows God's timetable. You know what you're saying, just how quickly. In your life, you'll see it. It's his timetable. It's his plan. It's his timetable. History always follows God's timetable and God's steering it for a particular purpose. History leads to God's kingdom coming. He's bringing it to a point. And you can go to passages of scripture that show God bringing it to a point. You, know, you can go to Matthew chapter 1 and all those begattings going on. Remember that bit? What's happening in all that begatting going on? What's happening is that God is moving human history to a point. So there are all these people from, from Adam down, right? And there's Adam falls into sin, and then you've got all and this record of the sinfulness of humanity in the heritage, in the genealogy of Christ. In his genealogy. And it comes down to the one man himself actually is true Israel. From one man to one man. The Israel of God. God is working it to his kingdom come. Pretty much getting there on time, which is unusual. What's happened here is that Habakkuk has poured out a bitter complaint to God. And we have them. Let's not be dishonest. Let's not be pretenders, hypocrites. He's pouring out a bitter complaint to God about the duration and the apparent lack of purpose that underlies the awful effect of the sinful rebelliousness of God's people in his time. God's people, you understand. Not the nations, not the nations, but God's people who simply adopted the ways of the nations in place of the ways of God, as he teaches them in his word. And Habakkuk, so far, has been on this journey, he set out, just, he just set out, on his journey with God over this vexed issue of why God allows departure from his truth, allows injustice, and allows violence to prevail. How can God allow his people in any land to get to the mess they get into. God's response hasn't been what Habakkuk anticipated. Does that sound familiar in any way? God's response not being what we'd anticipated. What an adventure in the life of faith is it? <laughs> what is that happen? God simply agrees with Habakkuk. And shows him that God knows far more about it than Habakkuk does and reveals that judgment, not mercy, is coming. And it's going to be harder to take than the nation's, the nation's excesses, which is what Habakkuk was complaining about in the first place. <laughs> Habakkuk's dangers got a lot worse. But God is working it for you and for glory. And it's going to call for far more investment in faith, Habakkuk. An awesome divine response to the trouble that Habakkuk sees hovers on the horizon of history. And God sees the problem more profoundly, even more seriously than this prophet in his perplexity. And God's resolution of the problems and answer to Habakkuk's prayers, well, it's going to seem overwhelming then, and it does, Paul Habakkuk. The underlying message of the book is going to be that a maturing faith trusts perseveringly in God's ways of establishing justice and righteousness on earth when it doesn't look like that's what's happening. And that his ways are not our ways. We don't get it. But he does. And he works it. He's working this thing. And Habakkuk wrestles with the burden of submitting to an utterly new concept of the Lord's purposes amongst Israel and the nations. It is new when we don't do change. Changes what's needed here. And God is interacting with his people and he's leading them forward in ways that are utterly contrary to anything they've come previously to expect. And the challenge is for the righteous to continue to live by faith through that Habakkuk too. Far. Tell me that's not a challenge that we're also facing. Tell me it's not.
this 605, 608 BC prophecy. Isn't it relevant to 21st century Western civilization? The way we experience and see it, and given what we have on the news, on the radio, and on the television every day. If God grant us then that we might be those who are counted righteousness, counted righteous by God through trust in Him through difficult times. He who has revealed to us that He is the Lord of history and is working everything to the ransom, to the redemption, to the restoration of His kingdom, of this fallen world. Just sure.